If you want to become a data scientist, all you have to do is get a master's degree in data analytics, right? Wrong, wrong, wrong. It might seem that everyone who got a job in big tech and fame went to a great school. It doesn't mean that's what actually differentiated. But I'll tell you guys a little secret. The easiest way to get a job in data science is if you focus on giving the employer what they actually want. That's how I got 10 offers in a span of two weeks, three months before I graduated from university. I'm gonna break down this process in five easy steps for you guys to get a job in 2024. Number one, get some experience. <sighs> now you might be wondering, well, Jay, how do I get that first position if I don't have any other experience? It's a chicken or egg problem. You need experience to actually get a job, but to get that first job, you won't have any experience at all. First thing to do is get an internship. It looks horrible to have no experience on your resume when you're applying to job. The reason why experience is so important is because it's social proof to potential employers that showcase that you can succeed in a workplace environment. The easiest way to do so if you're still in school is to get research positions. I got two researching internships before I actually landed my first paid internship. One of them that I did was actually just purely web scrape for a PhD student. They needed some company data for a finance dissertation. And so I did the legwork of actually scraping the data using Python and presenting it and formatting it in a way that they needed for their thesis. And you can bet that right when I got that research position and started working on it, I directly put it on my resume as I applied to jobs. If you guys are in this position and you need your first experience, internship, research position, please try this out. Just go to any PhD professor and ask them, what data do you need that I can help you scrape? I guarantee you any professor needs some sort of data scraped from the internet. It's literally all that they do is basically utilize scrape publicly available data for all their dissertations. And so if you guys can't find a job, this is the easiest way for you guys to get that first piece of experience. The second most common way that's a little bit harder is to be an unpaid intern for a startup. And I know there's a lot of flack around unpaid internships, but in this day and age, especially with getting that experience, it's honestly more of a benefit to you than it is to that company for them being able to basically onboard you and have you do work. Try to find something part-time so it doesn't take too much out of your studies, but getting an unpaid internship or some sort of position that you can put on your resume is really the first step into getting any kind of job. Number two, we're creating a portfolio. A lot of data scientists think their portfolio is equal to their website. Well, think again. Creating a portfolio that gets you a job is curating a portfolio that caters to companies that you are interested in. This means that if I'm applying to a company like Airbnb, then I'm going to be working on housing data science projects and analyzing different hotel data as well. But it's really important that the project that you work on is something that you're also interested in. I suggest everyone to use a three part framework when selecting projects to work on in data science for your portfolio. One, think about what am I interested? What are my hobbies? It's super important, again, to work on something that you yourself are interested in. Think about all the stuff that you do in your free time and try to narrow down something that you might be interested in that has data in it. Which brings me to the second point. What aspect of these hobbies involve data science? For example, when I was really interested in looking at rentals, housing, different kinds of apartments in Seattle, I started scraping data from Craigslist and I realized that all housing data is essentially a data science project because you could look at the price of different neighborhoods, you could predict the price of a rental by use, looking at the square footage. Um, there's so many different kinds of ways that you can apply data science to everyday things in your life. Some of them might require more modeling in which you're gonna be doing more of the prediction aspect and some of it might just be visualization aspect. So just being able to visualize something. And the third thing you need to realize is how easy is it to obtain this data? At the end of the day, the data that you get has to be at least easily available or at least scrapable from the web. Obviously, the harder to get that kind of data, the better it is because that makes your project a little bit more unique. Three, marketing your project. So many data scientists create a project and then do nothing with it afterwards. They might share it with their friends, they might post it on Twitter or LinkedIn, but after that, it doesn't get any traction. Now, why is that? The reasoning is because marketing your data science portfolio and your project is the best way to get leads for jobs. Again, the whole point about getting a data science job is about marketing yourself as an asset for the company to hire you. The only reason why I got 10 different offers from different companies when I was an undergrad was because I had worked on two different projects that had gotten picked up by different media platforms. One on the Seattle housing data project was picked up by Hacker News and got to 50,000 plus views. And another was on a Seattle crime data set that I analyzed and got picked up by the local news station who then interviewed me and then that got even 
even wider distribution towards people reaching out to see if I wanted a job at their company. Now, imagine how much easier that is to basically get companies coming to you than to actually go through and apply to endless and endless amounts of jobs. The truth is that this applies to almost anything else in life. When we're doing sales at interview query, whenever we cold reach out to other people asking them if they want to use our product, we get zero responses. And yet when we post blogs and content and get views on different kinds of insights that we make about the job market, we get tons of traction on our company. At the end of the day, you want eyeballs on your project and yourself that you make that are interesting, that showcase your skills in data science. So when you're doing your portfolio projects, don't just complete it at the very end and don't do anything. At the very least, write up a blog post about what you did and try marketing it on different social media channels as well as Hacker News. If you did a data visualization project, make sure it looks really nice and post it on our data is beautiful and see if it can get any traction there. Lastly, if you have any past projects done at those internships, ask the company before your internship ends if you can post about your project on Medium. 99% of the time, they would probably love for you to post and market their company. And so if you take some of the data and obviously probably obfuscate it a bit and post and write a blog post about it and share it, I bet you people will love it and you'll get new job opportunities after that. Four, strategically applying to jobs. Now, if you have to apply to jobs because you're not getting enough inbound interest or you want another channel for getting more internships and job opportunities, then it's important to be strategic about how you apply. Most people have a backwards way of looking at how the job application process goes. They think they need to write a cover letter for every single one of their job applications. And so they do a sloppy job in terms of having ChatGBT write their cover letter for every single company. Other people think that they need to be way more concerned and way more thoughtful about their job application process. So they spend all week curating their resume and their cover letter just for one specific job click send and then get really discouraged after an immediate rejection. Instead, you really need to be strategic about the process of the job search. Job applications should be a bimodal extreme, which means that we're doing applications in two different ways. We're being extremely thoughtful for our applications in one way, where we're applying to skewed amount of jobs and we're being less thoughtful and we're getting the numbers in for the second way on the other side of the extreme and we're applying to hundreds of jobs in the most efficient manner. The reasoning why this works is because it utilizes two strategies. The one where we're being thoughtful about the job application process, we should be curating our projects, resume, and cover letter around really uh, being a good fit for those jobs. And those should be the jobs that you feel like you care about the most and that you're the best qualified for as well. Obviously, you can't create a project for every single company. And so it's really important to be thoughtful about how your portfolio and how your resume kind of stands up for these few companies. Now for the rest of the jobs, what you need to play is set the numbers game because you can't be so curated for all these rest of the jobs that you need to apply to, but you still need to get interviews and jobs in your pipeline. And so here we need to apply to as many jobs as possible by just creating a good resume that gets in the door and utilizes some of the job applying strategies that we'll talk about later on. Again, if you think about the fact that most jobs have a 1% conversion rate from looking at your resume to actually bring you on to the technical or the recruiter screening interview, that means that you have to apply to almost a thousand jobs just to get 10 interviews back. Now, while that seems really daunting, obviously you can't do it if you write a personalized cover letter for all 1,000. So think about the job application strategy in terms of two modes. There's the jobs that you're curating your entire job search process around, and those are the jobs that you're just applying 10 jobs a day, 20 jobs a day, just to get the applications out there so that you can get a response back through sheer volume. Lastly, relentlessly preparing for interviews. After it's all said and done, you're creating these portfolio projects, you're applying the jobs left and right, you still have to pass the interview. And it's really important to relentlessly prepare for the interview from the day that you start your job search process. Now you don't have to start, you know, doing 10 plus lead code or interview query problems a day from the very beginning of your job search. You can start out really slow. But the whole point is to not cram before your actual interview. Almost all of us have 12 years of schooling in mind that basically ingrained into our head that cramming before a test does not work. The same thing goes for interviews. If you try to stuff yourself with practice right before an interview, it's not going to work. I think one misconception is that the technical part of the interview needs to be the most practice, which I think is a little overblown. I think a lot of people, especially in technical fields like data science and engineering, discount the actual behavioral interview part. Remember, when you're selling yourself to the 
employer, you're trying to give them what they want. And what they want is a 360 degree, cool, self-serving human that can basically work on projects and collaborate with the team. This means practicing both behavioral and technical interviews and reading a little bit more about the company culture before you jump onto the interview. Just taking one hour to understand and do some research about a company. What do they care about? What are their revenue metrics look like? What is their mission statement? And how am I contributing to their core values? All these questions, if answered, could just be a little bit helpful toward being a better candidate when you're actually going on that on-site interview or just understanding you know, what this company is about. And if you don't know what kind of questions are coming up for your data science interview, you can use interview query to basically figure out which question types are most asked for different kinds of companies. That way you won't be surprised. That segues me to my next point, which is that four years ago, I quit my data science job after getting fed up with failing so many different candidates that came to interview for different positions, but didn't know how to do simple technical SQL questions or how to answer simple key studies. If you're trying to get a data science job, the best resource that I have for you on your interview preparation portion, it's the number one resource that I wanted when I was in your guys' shoes. On Interview Query, you can find hundreds of interview questions, solutions, courses, and guides to help you for your next interview. But don't take just my word for it. Here's what one of our members has to say about getting a job on Interview Query. Hi, Jay. I just want to shout out for this amazing platform. My search is finally over. I will be joining Tesla as a data architect on Monday, I'm going to cancel my subscription for now. And that's what we love to hear. We love it when people get a job and they don't have to think about using any query anymore because they achieved their six figure data science or data engineering dream job. So check out interviewquery.com. And if you haven't liked and subscribed on this video, please do so as well. All right, that's it. We're done. I'm out.